Welcome to the Reading Room. Today we have the pleasure of welcoming Eric Chalk, the author of A Book of Poems, Last Days Here, which includes poems written in Hawaii Creole English, also known as Pidgin. He is co-founder of Bamboo Ridge Press with Daryl H.Y. Yilum. Uh, Eric Chalk has edited and has been published in many anthologies and collections and is the recipient of several awards, including the Elliot Cades Award for Literature, the Pushcart Prize, and the Hawaii Award for Literature. He was the coordinator of Poets in the Schools for the Department of Education for more than 20 years. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, your stories and poems have situations and events that many can relate to, especially in Hawaii. How would you describe your work and what do you write about? I guess I'm mostly known as a local poet mm -hmm. and I do write about Hawaii and local themes a lot. But I, I would also say that I, I have written um, about different things and in different ways at different times. And I think that's kind of normal for any um, artistic career. So as a student, you know, I, I learned what was being taught and I did a lot of imitations of contemporary poets like James Wright or Galway Canal, who actually both taught at UH for brief periods. Mm -hmm. And so those are mostly realistic, image-based poems. And I used to say to people when they asked me this question that I write about people. Then, um, you know, as ethnic literature emerged, uh, we got involved with Talk Story and, you know, we started Bamboo Ridge and then we wrote with more local themes in mind and things like growing up local, like yeah titles here and Small Kid Time Hawaii, that kind of reflects that shift. Um, now I would say that I do write mainly for myself, more personal things, and um, it's a lot of junk, not necessarily worth sharing, um, but you know, I write for me a lot. All right. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of memorable scenes uh, in your uh, book of poems last days here and in various publications. Uh, what is your favorite story or poem, and why is this work your favorite? Well, since Father's Day was just a few days ago, um, and one of my favorite poems is the poem for my father. Um, it always reminds me of when I was still a grad student living at home, you know, just working here and there part-time as a traveling poet and, um, you know, coming home late, <laughs> um, crashing there, and you know, what my parents were thinking about what's this guy doing, you know, he, he came back from college from the mainland and now he's, what is he doing? <laughs> Studying poetry, which is, you know, not what most people want their kids to do. But um, in June, when Father's Day is, it's also near my dad's birthday. And so um, the June that I graduated, I had my thesis, and uh, I wanted to give that to him as a gift. And so I, um, uh, I also had a, an award for the poem, mm -hmm. Poem for My Father, just coincidentally. And um, so I had this award letter from the city, and I put that in my thesis book on that page where his poem was. And um, I gave it to him. Uh, and he, he sat on the bed and he read it. He read the letter and he read the poem and he just said, hmm. And that was it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. nothing else. Um, but I like to say that I, I overheard him um, later on telling a friend of his, if it was a painting, they'd hang it up on the wall in City Hall, but it's just a poem. Um, but anyway, I also like to read this poem because it is an example of my process. Um, there's that thing about getting up in the morning and writing what's just fresh in your mind, maybe tied to dreams even. There's um, the thing that for me, um, especially if I got up a little late, I might hear him outside. Uh, he loved to work in the yard. He um, built all the stone walls around our house. Um, some with the help of uh, our neighbor, but he um, used to always be out there 
playing with the rocks, you know, with his hammer and chipping them. And one morning I heard him when I got up, and I, I could just envision him doing this, and I heard the sound of the hammer, and um, maybe I felt a little guilty about mm -hmm. my situation there. And so I just kind of, um, I don't know, I just got up and I started writing this poem. Mm, yeah. And so uh, I just followed the imagery that I imagined was outside my window. Mm. Poem for my father. Yeah. I lie dreaming when my father comes to me and says, I hope you write a book someday. He thinks I waste my time, but outside he spends hours over stones, gauging the size and shape a rock will take to fill a space to make a wall of dreams around our home. In the house he built with his own hands, I wish for the lure that catches all fish or girls with hair like long moss in the river. His thoughts are just as far and old as lava chips like flint off his hammer, and he sees the mold of dreams taking shape in his hands. His eyes see across orchids on the wall, into black rock, down to the sea, and he remembers the harbor full of fish, orchids in the hair of women, 30 years before he thought of me, this home, these stone walls. Some rocks fit perfectly into place with light taps of his hammer. He thinks of me inside, takes a big slice of stone and pounds it into the ground to make the corner of the wall. I cannot wake until I bring the fish and the girl home. Mm. Oh, thanks so much for sharing that. I can see the imagery and I really appreciate you sharing about your dad and you know, it's, it's such a good poem. Um, I, I know a lot of uh, people can relate to, you know, their, their relationships with their parents, especially when it comes to creative writing, you know, <laughs> I know. Like, as a major. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah, especially yeah. as like for all families, but even like yeah, Asian American families, you know, where they expect you to have a <laughs> certain type of, uh, they have a certain type of idea about what a profession is, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't go to college for liberal arts. <laughs> I see, I understand. Um, oh, yes. Um, I, I love how you, you know, you have your standard English poems and also you write in Hawaii Creole English uh, or Pidgin. Were there challenges um, in maintaining the authentic, authenticity of your creative work? And what is your advice for writers? You know, when I hear that question, I hear different things in it. Yeah. Like the word authenticity stands out mm -hmm. because especially back in those days when we were trying to establish a local literature or what is local, or what is literature, or what is a real, <laughs> authentic, literary piece by someone who is local, not a missionary from the mainland, or things like that. You know, there's so many complications when I just think of the question. So again, I kind of go back to, um, in the beginning for me, the challenges when I, when I went to grad school were just, um, you know, what is a poet? <laughs> um, yeah. Especially since, um, for my personal background, I, I actually started writing as writing songs for friends. Oh. And I guess people think that that's different. Oh. You know, poetry is this other thing. <laughs> and um, uh, so when I went to school, you know, I was trying to learn something that I thought was uh, more complex, mm -hmm. which I think it is actually. <laughs> Um, and um, I, I studied these people that I, um, mm. I mentioned. Um, and so in the beginning, um, I was just in that world. Mm. And in that world, for my um, workshops and for my thesis, I was told that, you know, uh, pigeon is okay for comedy, for booga booga. Mm. And, um, you know, and some of the professors enjoyed even going to the nightclubs and all that. But, you know, for your thesis, you know, mm. this is different. Think of your audience, you know, what you're trying to accomplish here, you know, to get this graduate degree and, you know, follow the script kind of thing, I guess. Mm. And I think that it was a matter of just trying to do what was best for me. I'm not mm. saying that 
there was something wrong with them for doing it. I mean, I think that's what our parents were like. I mean, when you say Asian American, of course, to me, that's kind of a, a, a non-local term. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that, yeah. That's a different thing altogether. Yeah. But for local parents, if they wanted their kids to go to college, yeah. um, Japanese and Chinese, especially maybe, you know, the, the Asian ones, then um, it was known that you would adapt and um, you know that's that's how it was you would learn to switch mm -hmm. and everybody did it and um, uh, you know I, I, I guess I could mention that in my home we didn't speak pidgin you know even though my mother grew up on a rural plantation <laughs> you know all her childhood um, you know she went to college and then she spoke more like a Nisei school teacher mm -hmm. And like in our family, always make jokes because you know when she would watch TV, she would correct their English, their pronunciation, you know, yeah. newscasters and you know, all that. So there was kind of that um, element. Um, but then, um, you know, it, in, when we went outside the house and you know playing with my friends at the playground or you know in school between classes, everybody would switch back and forth more or less. I think. Mm -hmm. And so it was nothing new, something you did. And then, as I said, when the ethnic minority literature movement became more uh, widespread in the whole country, and it was obvious that we were going to somehow fit in this category, all the different ethnic groups here, um, then there was more of that going on. And then I like to say also, the whole time I was in grad school and before that, I was already involved in um, local culture things. And so it was not like I felt like I was um, repressing anything, you know. And when I first started, I, I did forums on, um, one was called Preserve Local Culture, you know, and then one was Kaholave and mm -hmm. George Helm was the speaker. Um, and, you know, then I had um, on the KTUH radio show, um, we had um, poets come on, and the poets that I invited were like Liko Martin, you know, Waimanalo Blues, and We Are the Children, and you know, All Hawaii Stand Together, that guy, mm -hmm. and um, you know, Olamana, uh, Jerry Santos. We used to go and hear those guys all the time, you know, Daryl and friends. And so to me, those were um, poets yeah. worthy of putting on the show along with other people that just wrote and didn't sing. So to me, it was just yeah. like you adapt. When you have to do something, you do it. And when you want to do something else, you find a way to do that. Yeah. And just make sure you know what's pragmatic and know your context and what's appropriate and yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. So I don't know how far I'm getting <laughs> off the, the <laughs> no, question, no, but the challenges yeah. to me were um, more just what is a poet? <laughs> what is yeah. um, a real poet or what is art? You know, what is craft? What is art? Mm -hmm. Is there a difference? Does it matter? Like, what is a song versus a poem? Yeah. You know, these kinds of art, artsy questions. Yeah. And as far as challenges go, not just the authenticity thing, but there was more um, practical things. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. if everybody is assuming that pidgin is not um, a literary language, then there's no um, pidgin literature, and then there's no local literature, and then mm -hmm. Does that mean there are no local writers? So there are those issues. And then that means um, you don't get published. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, one of the biggest things that we did yeah. with Bamboo Ridge, um, with just like other ethnic groups on the mainland, is start your own presses. Yeah. All the different small presses got started. Mm -hmm. um, and try to introduce um, more uh, progressive yeah. standards for yeah. what is art. What, a, what is a, an a authentic voice? If Mark Twain can have yeah. colloquial Southern speak, mm -hmm. then Daryl Lum can have yeah. pigeon, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So just more um, uh, recognition, and if not, then create your own network, your own structures. Um, but try to get recognition, try to win awards, try to get um, readings, try to get paid for readings, oh, yeah. you know, try to get... Um, networks and invited to um, uh, places on the mainland, colleges, or maybe different kinds of uh, centers, mm -hmm. poetry groups, um, you know, the whole thing that yeah. all poets want 
you know, just you have to fight for those. And those are the challenges, except there's this other part of it. And so in some ways, that's more of a problem if you want to be you know, only in Poetry Magazine or the American Poetry Review. But if not, there are all these other options in our time that were coming up. And we created some of those options. Wow. So to me, there are challenges and there are different contexts and you can work around it. Wow. It's so, thank you so much for, you know, I, I know Bamboo Ridge Press. I, I, just, I just need to thank you and um, Daryl <laughs> um, just for creating that because I, I know as you were mentioning, there needed to be some press that would support the local voice. And um, I, I know I'm grateful and I know a lot of local writers are so grateful you know, for Bamboo Ridge Press. I just wanted to <laughs> express <laughs> gratitude for everything that you and um, Daryl has You're done and, um, for, for Bamboo Ridge Press. <laughs> it's, um, very, it's a very important uh, literary journal and um, I, I know it, it launched so many <laughs> writers you know, that uh, we might not know of you know, if it wasn't for a local press <laughs> like Bamboo Ridge, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's been fun. <laughs> um, I know that you have uh, a lot of stories and vignettes that include personal experiences. How do you deal with exposing yourself through your work? Are there topics that you would not write about? As a, as a writer, as a published writer, or as just a journal diary writer, or as an editor, you know, there are different kinds of answers, I would say. And um, the first thing I would say is um, you should write whatever you feel like writing. You know, like for me, from the beginning, um, uh, as, a, as a, a student, um, I started writing in journals. And my, actually, my sister for Christmas um, bought me one of those standard diaries. It's that hardcover, yeah. red and black, you know, tall book with each day of the year. And so if you miss a day, there's that date right there. Oh, I didn't do July 3rd. So, you know, I try to write every day. And sometimes it's just journalistic, but sometimes it's a poem or mm -hmm. song lyric or whatever. And then um, you... Um, you end up deciding, you know, what you're going to take out of that and share with your friend or your group or the person you wrote it for, or if you want to, you know, try to send it to a magazine or if it's for a class, or, you know, you have different purposes. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's like anything else, like there are some things I just wouldn't share with you <laughs> <laughs> or with my mother mm -hmm. or, you know. Yeah. And so to, to answer that question, it depends on the audience and, uh, who are you going to share it with? So there's that. As an editor, um, and because I've seen how some people have had negative feedback, and this is something that happens mm -hmm. more and more and more with the internet and all the social media and everything, you can just get slammed for, for anything. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so, you know, in the old days, I mean, I would tell people the equivalent, which is, you know, if your family is going to read this, <laughs> is it going to be really a big problem mm -hmm. and you know you should think about it and it's your decision to make just like with all the other personal things you may or may not say at the dinner table mm -hmm. or at a potluck or mm -hmm. you know after you've had too many beers <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. it's that kind of an issue for me yeah. um, so it depends but i think that you know in the end of course you have to think of yourself as an author or writer and um, how far you want to push yourself because of course a lot of times people define uh, creative artists, original artists as people who break barriers and so part of that definition means saying things that you know your, your mother doesn't want to hear <laughs> and um, they're part of your audience. <laughs> good point, yeah. yeah. Wow, Yeah. thank you so much because that, that advice is really good for uh, all the writers out there because everyone has their own different level of comfort in terms right. of what, what they're going right. to um, divulge to <laughs> to the public. Yeah. And some things you just keep to yourself. That's true. <laughs> you can still work on it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. 
Oh, we talk a lot about writing, and I know, you, especially you visited a lot of schools, and uh, you worked with, um, uh, let's see, uh, poets in the schools uh, for the Department of Education. Uh, what would you describe about your writing process? How would you describe your writing process? So I guess I'll come back to that journal thing, mm -hmm. but that, that is how I started. Um, and as I went through my years of learning about um, the writing process and how different people do it, there are some key phrases that kind of stuck in my mind. So one of them is the fishing analogy. And that one is basically the idea that you go fishing every day, throw your net out every day, and your skills will improve. Um, and also, the more you go, the more likely you are to catch a fish, <laughs> a, a big fish. Um, so there's the fishing analogy. Um, and especially when you're a student, it's good to want to go every day, practice a lot more. Like I said, have a, a journal that you write in every day. And a lot of teachers will tell you, you know, it helps to practice. There are things that you can practice. They can tell you different kinds of exercises, starting with just rhythm and rhyme and all the kind of old-fashioned metrics and mm -hmm. metaphors and symbols, you know, the whole thing. Then, once you get going, there's the epiphany theory, you know, from, I guess, from Catholicism or Christianity. Sometimes you have an epiphany, like it's a gift from God. Something strikes you or whatever that is. And I think that's why people used to carry, you know, notebooks and scratch paper and pen all the time. Or, or you'd have the famous star about people writing in a French cafe in a napkin. Oh, yeah. Like yeah. something came, so they had to write it down. Yeah. So you have the coffee stains and everything on it. But um, by that um, theory, well, then you don't have to always be writing every day. But you do have to kind of um, want enough to um, have something to write on when you do get struck with a, a good idea. Because, you know, if you don't, it's easy to forget. Everybody yeah. forgets. And sometimes things come back, sometimes they don't. And then there's this basketball analogy, which I've heard in different ways, but I like to attribute it to Wing Tech Lum. And uh, once in our group, we were talking I don't know who, who's writing we were talking about or why we got to this, but the, the point was you can do a lot of fancy dribbling, but if you don't score once in a while, it's not worth it. <laughs> yeah. Like, no matter, no matter how good you are dribbling, you have to aim for the basket. You have to at least try. And that speaks to the idea that there's something more than just the craft and being able to use the language well. Um, and, and that maybe is more difficult to define, more intangible, maybe more something related to what is art in the capital A sense, whatever it is. But, um, you know, th there is that. And I kind of believe in that. Not everyone does. You know, a lot of people think, you know, you just do what you do, whatever art it is. If it makes you feel good, you know, that's good enough. Mm -hmm. And um, that's fine. Uh, I find it harder to, um, to um, teach that way when you're a teacher, especially if you have to give grades, <laughs> if you have to have a product. Mm -hmm. yeah. But of course, you know, there was like the new school, you know, and just go hang out in the room with the couches and whatever you do, <laughs> you pass. Um, so it's, again, it depends on your context and what you want to get done and your choice. Um, when you're doing the journal thing, I had this other um, idea, and I wrote into a poem uh, called "A Squid Eye," oh, yeah. from when we were, when I was younger, mostly, and we would go um, s squidding or, um, you know, spearfishing and going at night with the lantern and the squid box, and mm -hmm. especially when it's darker. But even in the day, when they're on the reef, you can hardly see the octopus, and so. There were some people that, you know, we just thought, wow, that they always see it first. Oh, wow. You know, and you can go over the same reef and you didn't even see it. Yeah. But some people can really spot the big taco. And so we would call that, oh, you get squid eye. Mm. And 
you know, a lot of stuff that we write in our journals is just junk. <laughs> That's what they told us. You know, it's just um, personal. It's just self-indulgent. It's just stuff that you have to get out for whatever reason. Maybe it's good in the long run, but as a poem itself, uh, maybe not good enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so there's that, that um, part of my process is mm -hmm. like trying to develop that so you know um, maybe what's worth sharing. Yeah, thank you. And then, of course, I believe in uh, a lot of um, rewriting. I know some people don't, but I do um, usually maybe half an hour to an hour of rewriting on a one or two page poem at first, and then I, I put it away, and you know, I, I pretty much know I'm going to come back to it in the next day or two. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I might not come back to it for a week or a month, and I often go back to poems after several months or even years. <laughs> um, and now, especially with computers, I mean, I'm going over, <laughs> you know, <laughs> flash drives. <laughs> stuff that's at least 10 years old and, I, and you know, every time I read it, I want to rewrite it. So there were those poets like that, right, who, like uh, Whit Whitman who wrote Leaves of Grass. Mm -hmm. This is one book, he just kept revising it for, yeah. what, decades? Or, <laughs> yeah. I don't know how long. There are yeah. people like that. And I guess I think that um, uh, it's, it's hard to write uh, the thing perfect all one time mm -hmm. and it helps to be able to go over it. So that means that you have studied you know, what all these structures are in terms and, mm -hmm. you know, practiced and yeah. um, kind of know what you're doing. Oh, wow. Yeah. Ooh, a lot of, lot of good um, advice and, you know, about your writing process and how there's a lot of different ways to, to write. And uh, I know, like, no matter how talented a writer is, sometimes they have writer's block. Well, what is your cure or solution to writer's block? What do you think? <laughs> Again, I'm going to say that the, the whole question <laughs> <laughs> depends on, on what context it's in. Mm -hmm. So like when you're a student mm -hmm. and you have an assignment, then you have to do it, yeah. right? Or if you're not a student even and like, um, like someone asked me for some pigeon poems mm -hmm. and I thought, oh, I don't have any new ones. I better write something. You know, so even as a so-called semi-professional writer, you might have an assignment. Um, and then um, for me as just a, a personal journal writing um, poet that, um, you know, where it doesn't matter to me about publishing really, I've published a lot and <laughs> I'm, I'm more interested now in being able to write something that, that I, I like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, so that's, that's a different kind of situation. But... Um, yeah, in, in that case, you know, there, there hardly is anything that I would call a block. Oh, yeah. It's just I'm going to go into my, my, my journal um, and just come back to it, you know, whenever I feel like. Mm -hmm. And if I don't feel like it, I don't have to. <laughs> but um, as a student, um, I, I like the, the, um, the strategy that I've heard of trying to distract yourself after you work on something for a while mm -hmm. and go and do something else completely yeah. not related and then come back to it. Like, I like washing dishes. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and for us, looking out the window of the sink, you know, you can see out the window, look at the birds, yeah. check out if, you know, the avocado is getting ripe or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, your mind just goes somewhere else mm -hmm. and then there's space in your mind yeah. for the essential elements of the poem mm -hmm. to sort of just come back. Um, yeah. But if you think about it too hard, too long, maybe it gets all cluttered in there and tangled, and so you have to yeah. sort of clear it up. And I think dishwashing is good. And yeah. um, I also find that if I'm doing yard work, I, I often involuntarily end up thinking about poetry. Oh, wow. Or mm -hmm. not my own maybe, but maybe, uh, you know, something we're editing, yeah. you know, a project we're on. Um, um, uh, a controversy, you know, a struggle, you know, just any issue, it just comes up. It's really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, but yeah, distracting yourself. And that's why I think um, uh, when I got um, older and 
got a semi-regular job and did more traveling, yeah. um, I found that um, to be helpful. Mm. And I guess I think it's uh, sort of related because you're getting away from yeah. home, your, your yeah. entire context. And as a local writer, mm. you know, just to like go sit in a cafe in Montreal or something, yeah. you're totally mm -hmm. apart from it. And yet it, it, it might still come back to you again. Yeah. Um, but um, without all the clutter and the tension, of, like I'm at my keyboard and I have to do this and here are my books and, you know, whatever it is that that are also um, part of the, the context for having to write something. Because in my, in my mind, block implies having to do it. Um, mm -hmm. So there's that. And um, yeah, travel. Yeah. That's a good one. Um, I think I should also say reading has always been important oh. to me. Mm -hmm. I think that um, even before being a student, uh, Reading poems that interested me always made it um, like I wanted to imitate that. I wanted to write my own version of something like that, mm -hmm. you know. And because I enjoyed whatever it was I reading, I was reading, and you know there were um, some insight into humanity, or just some neat phrase or image or symbol, or just a sound, you know, in a phrase or something like that that was intriguing, you know. Uh, as a word person, I wanted to mm. to do something like that. And then as you get older and you read different kinds of things, I mean, you, you see that people write about different topics. Mm. You see that people write with different styles. You see that people are writing with different styles and structures that you're not even aware of. Yeah. Like, um, I always remember like when John Logan came here and taught for a while, I, I didn't know that he was writing in syllabics. So, in my mind, like haiku or syllabics, where you count syllables. But he would make up his own structures, like I'm going to do 11, 15, 11, 15, or stuff like that. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know, and so as you read, you learn about different themes, different ideas, but also different strategies, different structures, the mechanics. And to me, if you're interested in doing that, mm -hmm. um, when you read more, it opens your eyes. You want to try to to do more yourself, and so I always think reading is always good, mm. and um, it may take you away from whatever block you're stuck in. Yeah. Um, it may take you somewhere else, but <laughs> you won't be blocked. <laughs> <laughs> good, good advice. Wow. Um, now, as you know, you're an award-winning author, and uh, many people appreciate your work and discuss your works in classrooms. Think of a time before all of your publications. What advice do you have for anyone who wants to be a writer? So, especially when I was poet in the school and traveling around all the public schools, and then, you know, talking to a lot of college and university classes, a lot of the question um, would be related to making a living. Oh. <laughs> and so I would always be answering this in terms of, no, this is not a good job. <laughs> you know, have a plan B, have a regular day job. All my friends have day jobs. You know, a lot of writers are teachers, and you can say it's related, but in my experience, there's a lot of non-creative um, writing <laughs> work that goes along with being a teacher, you know, committee work and reports and grants, and, you know, who knows what. But, um, yeah. This idea of like being a poet in a garret, drinking a lot of wine and going out all night and hanging out with artists and, you know, it's hard to live that way. <laughs> and, um, and I lived in a, in a 13 by 13 foot studio for 10 years, you know, with the garret coming down the slanted roof t down to the floor and, you know, eating oatmeal for dinner. And maybe you don't want that for 10 years. <laughs> you know, there's other things in life that are fun. <laughs> and so, yeah, I tell people, it's a great hobby, <laughs> um, but unless you're willing to make a lot of sacrifices, you know, everybody gets a day job, you know, and, and um, you, can, uh, you can work it out. So that's kind of the first answer. Mm -hmm. But related to what we were saying before, I think that um, after, like, studying a lot, whether you um, go to school or do it on your own, mm -hmm. I think that the, um, the ethnic minority lit movement 
Um, what it taught us is the importance of groups and organizations and networks. And whether it's just a small writing group, like Bamboo Ridge started a writing group, you know, and called it a study group, um, or some people just go meet at coffee shops, whatever, and sometimes the coffee shops organize groups, you know, I think that those are good. Um, I think that you, know, you can share not only your own work, but things you've read. And then again, the way I look at it, you learn about not just topics you can write about and what people are willing to talk about, but also the ways people write mm -hmm. uh, their poems. Okay. And um, the thing about it is to me is, in the process, you have to be convincing each other that you know what is good. <laughs> because people all have different ideas of what is good and yeah. a lot of people think it's totally subjective oh. and when I've had students like that I mean I've had to tell them you know in the end you may be right and I know a lot of artists feel that way but in this class I have to give a grade oh. and I have to have some kind of rubric mm, yeah. and so this is my rubric and if you want we can adjust the rubric what's your idea mm -hmm. and as a poet in the school you know, poetry was not a popular thing. Um, it was popular with teachers because they didn't like poetry, and so it was good that someone else would come in and teach poetry. Mm -hmm. But the point is, to, to get into all these schools, we had to convince um, mm -hmm. teachers and then principals, administrators, you know, the DOE, district people, that it was a good thing. And so we had to read poems to them and talk about what it was doing, how it was good for just literacy, uh, much less for creative writing and you know emotional expression you know find all the different values you can in poetry and then give them an example and then convince them that it's doing all this stuff you said it was doing mm -hmm. and so to have to do that with those people and then to the students who might be eight <laughs> mm -hmm. or 16 or whatever class you're in you know it's like every day for 20 years I was trying to convince people of how good this poem was when it did this, which is to me kind of very specific. Mm -hmm. And so I think when you get a little study group, a bunch of friends, it's not just that you're having coffee and dr drinking wine and enjoying each other's company. Mm -hmm. uh, you can really learn a lot if you push yourself to define what you think is good. Just know what you like. And then why do you like that? Mm -hmm. You know, is it just because it's talking about um, you know, some image that you can relate to, you know, in, in your life, or is there more to how it's being presented, mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Wow, goodness. Oh, thank you so much for sharing. Oh my goodness, I really appreciate the information that you've been, you know, sharing your work and you're spending time with all of us in the reading room. And so I just wanted to say thank you so much for, for being here. No problem, thanks for having me. Thanks. <laughs> And thank you all of you for joining us uh, for another episode of The Reading Room. We would like to thank Eric Chalk for joining us. Thank you. Thanks again. Awesome.